Hare Krishna, Krishna Vishak Pro. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. No, it's been a... Thanks for having me here. Thank you. It's, I think we have known each other for almost about 10 years now. More than that, probably. It's a little more, yes. No, it's, I have always appreciated your friendship and especially how you have helped me understand our tradition better. And it's, I read your thesis on Bhakti Not Thakur also. So I think uh, also the fact that you come in, your lineage is related to Bhakti Not Thakur also makes it special. I could say you're an authentic Gaudiya scholar. You're authentic from the traditional perspective and authentic from the contemporary perspective also. As you did your PhD in uh, Chicago Divinity. So Bhakti Not Thakur engages with the contemporary tradition or a contemporary yeah. intellectual tradition. And uh, can you give some examples of say some things which you felt were addressed by Bhakti Not Thakur's in a writings in a way that had not heard being addressed before and that helped you to... So when we say he brought in a dialogue, we often understand that Bhakti Prabhupada went and presented Krishna consciousness in the West and the movement as it started in the West. But Prabhupada also says that the, I think the father of the modern day Krishna consciousness movement is Bhakti Not Thakur. Hmm. In a sense, Prabhu, Bhakti Not Thakur wrote, uh, laid the intellectual groundwork Hmm. And Prabhupada took it further. So, uh, so yes. uh, can you explain this point about which questions or some either some issues or some questions which Bhakti Thakur, the way he addressed, attracted you? Yeah, sure. Um, I would try. I would try to approach that question by thinking through the idea of what it means to be a liberal. Okay. Excuse me. And what is it? What does liberal arts mean? So Bhaktivinoda Thakur had the educational training in the liberal arts. And he was a liberal, not in the modern political sense, but in the sense of an all-encompassing worldview. And in his introduction to Sri Chaitanya Shikshamrita, the very first line says, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya can resolve all contradictions that arise in various philosophies. Mm. One idea. It's like, Just one wow. Liberal in the modern sense and liberal in the all-inclusive sense. What is the difference? The difference is, you know, the word liberal in today's political discourse has a certain baggage, right? It is, it, it is often identified with left inclined thinkers, as well as um, people who, are, who belong to an elite intellectual class who is disconnected with the common suffering of everyday people. That's how the word liberal is often understood. That's and they like an elite, intellectual elite and then leftist. Yeah. Intellectual elite, leftist, disconnected with grassroots problem and at the same time takes the first seat when it comes to trying to represent these people in the grassroots. That's well put, very nicely put, yeah. So right. I think a couple of other things also is when led with the disconnected itself is liberals seem to be quite uh, against tradition. They, they, that's, the, that's the modern perception and my argument is Bhakti Gunan Thakur is the opposite. He is a liberal who is very much within the tradition, more than you can imagine. And it is possible to be within a tradition and still be liberal. We would probably want to use a different word today, given the political baggage that word has. Mm. But a liberal means somebody who is willing to, you know, include everyone as long as they are not against the principles of dharma. That's true. Right. I've noticed that people may espouse some liberal positions, hmm. but often they have quite an illiberal disposition. And this is also something Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur pointed out many times in his life, saying that what kind of a broad minded person, or you could translate that as the word liberal, what kind of a liberal or a broad minded person are you that you will not tolerate any other argument? 
than the ones that you've already set your mind on. That's so true. They're quite <laughs> liberal about anyone who does not espouse the liberal position. Yes. Yeah. And so, and that so, the right wing that that people, at least in the United States, sorry, go ahead. Are you referring to somebody particularly when he's talking about this? I read it in different, you know, when I, I, I didn't, when I read, read through all these books, I didn't pinpoint like context. Okay. Yeah. Look into details. So I don't remember the context, but I've written at least two or three places. Okay. What kind of a liberal or a, you know, broad minded person are you? And he's saying this to some of the scholars in his times, hmm. right. Who are a part of the establishment. Um, so Bhaktivinoda Thakur, as far as I understand, you know, I mean, from a worldly perspective, we are all humans and there must be some problem somewhere. <laughs> and so if you want to dig holes in his life, you know, he has given his autobiography and said, you know, this is for my friends and followers. Just make sure that it doesn't get into wrong hands. Basically, people who will just use it to dig holes and create more ruckus. Mm -hmm. If they want to do that, that is their business. That is their, you know, that's their prerogative. But Vaishnavas usually say that you know flies and honeybees in Bangla they call machi and momachi mm. they look very similar but they go to different destinations mm. based on their ruchi or taste so let's leave that conversation at that <laughs> mm. um, coming back to some of the questions that we brought up before the zoom uh, podcast uh, and the role of Bhaktivinoda Thakur that you asked right now um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote an article called Dwaranda Saraswati and Tantra Shastra. Mm. So it's his article on Tantra. In that article, he says that Dwaranda Saraswati, who we know very well, in, okay, just, you know, just, just pause. So are you ad means are you addressing that my earlier question of how Bhaktivinoda Thakur say addressed some issues which were not addressed earlier, or you yes, know, Thakur as, help, at you, this, help you to stay yeah, as no, I, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to address yeah, okay. all the three points you raised that the idea about Western academia or being an academic, the idea of liberal. The second is how Bhaktivinoda Thakur helped me. And number three, how Bhaktivinoda Thakur is liberal in his own way. And that's, those are the three things I'm trying to address. In this article, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that Dhananda Saraswati should not criticize tantras because he's saying tantras allow eating meat and alcohol and all these kind of quote unquote abominable activities. It's not Hindu. It should be it should be a part of Hindu reform to get rid of the of tantric practices. Mm. And Bhaktivana Thakur says that Mahashai, very respectfully sir, or this gentleman, has no idea about Hinduism. He says that Lord Shiva is said to have composed the tantras because Lord Shiva is Vishnu in touch with the mode of tamas. And there are people in the mode of tamas who will need to eat meat and drink alcohol. So Lord Shiva gives a particular, uh, you know, kind of a step-by-step -step process for their gradual evolution to the, you know, in the journey of self-discovery, so to say. And it is also the responsibility of Vaishnavas, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, to come to rescue of their Shakta brethren or Shakta friends or Shakta, you know, Shakta brothers and sisters when the Shaktas are not able to defend their own scriptures. Because all of this is within the ambit of Dharma. Now, that article <laughs> is. Possible. Remarkable. And in a second article, Bhaktivinoda Thakur reviews a book written by the elder brother of Swami Vivekananda, in which he analyzes the character of Ramakrishna. Now, remember, Ramakrishna was not that famous when he was writing this article. And he says, I hear about this Babaji who lives in Dakineshwar, who's become very popular, and he's doing, you know, he's showing signs of spiritual ecstasy. And if this Babaji is genuine, I offer Shoto Koti Dandavat Pranam. I offer my respects to him again and again and again. At the same time, 
you know, these are the symptoms of ecstasy, according to Rupa Goswami. And we must know what those are. And we must, you know, be careful to, ja to separate the husk from the grain, so to say. It's my, in my language. I'm summarizing it. And so he ends that article in a positive note, saying, if Ramakrishna, Param you know, Ramakrishna is indeed a Paramahamsa, then I respect him. It's, a, you know, so that to me defines what is liberal in the sense he's not compromising his position as a Vaishnava, but he's also creating the space for others to be who they want. And the third article I wanted to mention in this regard, and this is the last one, is Krishto Ridai Vaishnav Dharma Rudai, the dawn of Vaishnavism in a Christian heart. And in that article, he says, there can be Vaishnavs who wear Tilak Mala, but they're not Vaishnavs. They're Bodhavaya, Vaishnavs. They are trying. They are progressing. At the same time, this Christian gentleman is so devoted, but also look at his Siddhanta. Here are the points of his Siddhanta. And these Siddhantas are no different from what somebody like Jiva Goswami gives us. And so we as Vaishnavs must, if we are Saragrahis, that means essence seekers, rather than burden bearers, we must recognize this John Newman, Christian gentleman with a European name, to be a Vaishnav just like us. Right? Mm. So to me, that not only was uh, remarkable on a personal level, it's like I, for the first time I saw this broad definition of what is bhakti, but I also saw that he was not narrow-minded, thus liberal, narrow versus liberal, mm. right? Liberal means broad. Um, and he, in a way, professed values that were very Vaishnav, and very traditionally Vaishnav. And he says, and I'll conclude with this, Shakole Shwanmana Korite Shakrati Deho Nath Jatha Jatha. Give me the strength to respect everybody according to my capability and how what they deserve. And Vaishnavs offer respect, Amani Manado. That means if there is something going on that is against the values of Dharma, and Dharma goes back to the Srimad Bhagavatam, Satya, Socha, Tapa, and Taya. Right? Satya is honesty. Yeah. Uh, for those, you know, Socha is purity or cleanliness. Tapa is enterprise, austerity, penance, whatever. And Daya is compassion or kindness. So that is what Dharma means to. You know, that was, that's what it meant in my family. That's how I was taught. Um, Srila Prabhupada translates, you know, those into the English term for regulative principles. Um, he talks about four pillar, pillars of religion also. Four pillars of dharma. So as long as those ethical values were kept, then it's all right. Yes, please. Yes, man. I mean, this is, I feel a slightly different subject. But those three letters, I was, or three articles, letters, whatever you want to say. Articles. It was published in the Sajjana Toshni Journal. Okay, articles. So now, these three, if we consider Vaishnavism as it is practiced today, we yeah. could say these three, in one sense, are considered as the competitors or challenges to Vaishnavism. The worship of the Devtas, the Advaitavad philosophy, and mm. say, uh, non-Vedic dharmas like Christianity. Mm. And mm -hmm. it seems Bhaktivinoda Thakur is openly appreciating all three of them, not in intrinsically, but to no, the... No, not worship of the devatas. It's not no, no. a worship of the devatas. No, it's completely complete. Yes, appreciating please. Appreciating them in the sense that, not that he's recommending the worship of the devatas, but he is recognizing that it also has a place. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, now, sometimes I feel that in trying to present Vaishnavism to people, mm -hmm. we may end up leaving no place for anything else. That it is true. It becomes like a, see, one of the ways I differentiate is spiritual life is not one zero. It's not digital logic. It's more of analog. <laughs> analog. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. A I put it this way. Yeah. I put it this way. I say it's not just about salt and pepper. We also have garam masala. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> and turmeric. 
yeah. and jeera you know our spice box has diversity that's very right, because i think spices are not so well known in the west mainly they no. came from india itself so it's a very no. unique example also so hmm. now we tend to define things in terms of polarity one or zero so hmm. like you are a devotee or you are a non devotee it's spiritual or it is material hmm. but within that there is a spectrum absolutely bhakti na thakur recognize that spectrum and say from us too and bhakti siddhant the two everybody recognizes that spectrum so, so the, yeah of course you know if we look at prabhupad writings that is there at is like prabhupad i think in the same verse tikshava karunika where he talks about the qualities of a saint yes tikshava karunika surda sarvadehi nama jat shastra shanta sadhava sadhu bhushana so right. in this sense in this verse there is no specific mention of necessarily worshiping a personal deity but prabhupad yes. says this can also apply to a person who is not not a personalist to a vadi also so that they can even an impersonalist is a transcendentalist yes that is true and can be a saintly person so prabhupad so we say bhakti nath thakur is appreciating the saintliness is he is not like wholly endorsing if he exhibits if he is as you say if he is authentic or if he is genuine then i offer my obeisances and yes. third case he is talking about vaishnavism not so much as a a specific practice as more of a more of a you could say a universal emotion like rising of christianity in the heart rising of vaishnavism in the heart of a christian mm-hmm. so he is talking more of it of a emotion might be a little cheap word not an appropriate word but maybe it's like a uh, it's rasa the word is rasa yeah and his point is rasa is universal yeah so by the way if i may interject yeah last month i had a almost a one hour conversation with wendy donegar and we were both appreciating how rasa is universal and she said yes that is true you know just as there are elements of dharma or ethics that can be translated across cultures mm. there are elements of yoga that can be translated across cultures so is rasa that can be translated across cultures and if you look at it dharma is sambandha in a sense yoga is avidheya and rasa is prayojana and that is what krishna bhakti is in those three words sambandha sambandha okay he, you know that is when you know what is ishwar prakriti jiva kala and karma then you practice dharma you respect all forms of life and you know and then for your own internal self you practice yoga bhakti yoga whatever but then the purpose for bhakti yogi especially is the experience of rasa and that is the prayojan so chaitanya mahaprabhu gave the essence of krishna bhakti uh, based on what is called the anubandha chatushtaya in sanskrit hermeneutics sambandha avidheya prayojan these three words and the chaitanya charitamrita talks about it and bhagavatam also has these three words kind of encapsulate what is bhakti and the, the fourth word that is the adhikari the person who is going through the process mm-hmm. right so sambandha avidheya prayojan in practical terms right is dharma yoga and rasa and those are the three things that are universally translatable at least according to bhakti vinod thakur and you know rajiv manohotra says uh, when idaniger is the most powerful lady in hindu studies in the west today right and they 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 disagree with each other and you know i don't want to get into that that's true but i have read both their works and i see if i were to if 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 bhaktivan thakur was here in the room with us today i think this is what he would tell us he would tell us that there are enough people on planet earth to debate each other to look at their differences but if we give chaitanya mahaprabhu a chance he will show us the way where people with the most amount of differences can also come together in harmony and in peace for a constructive purpose for planet earth which is what dharma is supposed to do according to the bhagavatam if we practice dharma planet earth lives well right beautiful just 
to go back to a couple of points now. So rasa, sure. rasa is a rasa can be a potential universal concept, and it is. You could say it's one of the things which uh, our tradition, the Gaudiya tradition, has distinctly to offer to world. That's what Bhakti Vinod Thakur said. Yeah. So now, taking that point further, you went back. You you said earlier also talk about Mankim Chandra who wrote a. You could say a sanitized version of Krishna he presented. Hmm. Hmm, sure. So now, so it's he removed some of the leelas whose moral morality was questionable. In morality some, from a from a Western educated perspective, because yeah. morality is also yeah relative. Quite, yeah. Relative. But then it's in some ways the, those are the those are the pastimes which actually give the experience of rasa. Isn't it? Yes. You consider Krishna yes. is Mahabharat. Yes, mm. Krishna is Krishna is expert. He's shrewd. He guides the Pandavas. He's in Veera Rasa. Yes. Veera Rasa. Veera Veera is one of like Hasya is one. Yeah. yeah you know, Jugupsa is one. So Krishna is in that Rasa, but in Bhagavatam he's in Shringara Rasa. Hmm. So and a... sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So now. Yes, I agree. Uh, this point that uh, presenting Krishna or rather taking the Bhagavatam version of Krishna or Bhagavatam vision of Krishna uh -huh. and uh, not watering it down or not fitting it to modern sensibilities, but right. explaining it in a way that uh, modern sensibilities can also appreciate. That's the book Krishna Samhita. That's what he tried to do in Krishna Samhita. Yeah, I think in his autobiography also he writes that many people didn't understand the purpose of the book and that's why it became somewhat controversial. Yes, he mentions that people did not understand the difference between Paramarthika and Aparakrita. Paramarthik Artha is, you know, Dharma, uh, sorry, uh, uh, is uh, Dharma Artha Kama Moksha, right? The four Pur Purusharthas. Parama Artha is, you know, something transcendental to this, mm. in a sense, spiritual, that take, gives the essence of the Arthas. But uh, Aprakrita, prak, Prakriti is nature. So whatever is Paramarthika is still within nature. Aprakrita is, on the other hand, transcendental. So the difference between spiritual and transcendental is very subtle. And I pointed out that difference in the Krishna Samhita, which people do not understand. That's what he said in his autobiography. So what exactly is the difference? He's talking about that Krishna Leela is Aprakrita. Krishna Leela is untouched by matter. And so Krishna Aprakrita is Akhila Rasamrita Murti. So Aprakrita you are translating as transcendental. Transcendental. And, and Paramarthika I am translating as spiritual. So spiritual... Bhakti Siddhanta will translate... A prakrita as supra mundane. Okay. Mm. Mundane is things that are going on in the world. So even if you're spiritual, you're still in the world. You're still functioning with the parameters of the world. But Vyasadev accessed the leelas of Krishna in his samadhi. And it is only through the process of bhakti yoga you can come to that level of samadhi where you understand what is rasa. And at that level, Krishna Leela, you realize, is not of this world. It's totally supramundane or transcendental. And he says, that is what readers of Krishna Samhita did not understand very well. Hmm. So spiritual can refer to generic spirituality also, like say monistic or yeah. something like that. But when you're talking about transcendental or what you mean, aprakrita. Supramundane. So Paramarthik refers to anything beyond matter, like taking up some, some eternal interest. But that is your, you know, that is your spiritual development. And you can go, you know, you can become a Buddhist or you can become a Christian or you can become an atheist, but you are seeking the truth, but you're still within the world, right? A dog trying to catch its tail. And you have not transcended the limitations of this world through your practice of bhakti yoga and come to the level 
of realizing what is rasa and the point where you realize what is rasa, the holy names feel different, right? And the 10 Nama Paradhas are impossible to do, right? But more importantly, we realize that the level of the, the, the rasical level of chanting the holy names that the Nama, Rupa, Guna, Lila, they are actually not separate. They're just four dimensions of the same thing. Right? And that Nama can be chanted in various rasas. It, you can chant the you know, holy name in Shanta Rasa for, you know, for tranquility or whatever. But the holy names can also be chanted in Madhurya Rasa, for instance, where Hare is what Krishna calls Radha. And Rama is what Radha calls Krishna back. Hmm. Because Rama means somebody who knows how to please. Or some, you know, the pleasure potency as Sri Prabhupada translated it. Right? Hare. And so the Hare Krishna mantra is, you know, the, the play of Radha and Krishna. And when you, when you chant or when you sing the names, you suddenly realize this is a love song. And Rupa Goswami wrote in his Upadeshamrita that the mantra needs to be chanted or sung or recited with Adara. Adar means to adore. So I was just speaking with Yogeshwar Prabhu a um, couple of weeks back, Joshua Green. He's okay, one so of I'm, my mentors. Huh? What is the point you're making over here? Are I'm, I'm coming to that. Yeah, about Thakur. Yeah. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Rasa, and uh, on misunderstanding Rasa from a worldly perspective and doing certain things. And your previous point about Vaishnavism, how, may, how Vaishnavism that many people practice today, uh, hinging on the works of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Srila Bhaktivinoda Saraswati, and Srila Prabhupada, is very different, or at least appears very different, from what these Acharyas are saying in their books. That's what I'm trying to point out. Okay. And so the singing of the holy names is the constant remembrance of the love song. And that's how Mahaprabhu presented it. Iha shrape jakogya koriya nirvanda. Nirvanda means firm resolve. You know, kirtan yu shada hori. All the time. Yeah? Kirtan does not necessarily mean to hold a japamala in your hand. Even what you and I are doing in a very broad sense is kirtan. Huh? That is also Kirtan because the, the result of Kirtan is Tushanti Ramanti, you know, as Krishna says. It is Tushti, right? And Ramanti is also related to the word Ram, that is delight, one who delights. And so that holy name can be chanted in Sakyaras, in Vatsalyaras, and so and so forth. But if we do not follow a step-by-step -step process that Rupa Goswami has given out in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, you know, it's like, and this is something our, <laughs> our common mentor, Radhanath Swami and I, kind of, we, we've gone back and discussed this many, many times. That is, unless we have a systematic progression through Bhakti, we can take initiation, but many years will pass and we will be st stuck in the same level. It's like enrolling in a school and there are no classrooms or, you know, the rooms are there, but the classes are not divided and the education isn't happening. So Krishna consciousness is a scientific process of um, cultivating the wisdom of the heart, so to say, right? And now, what Bhaktivinoda Thakur pointed out in Bhokim Chandra Chatterjee and many others of his times, that when you are divorcing Krishna from Rasa, then the Krishna you are trying to talk about is not the Aprakrita Krishna. It is not the supramundane Krishna. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing we have to, the two more things, very quick points and they can explain if you ask anything. One is we use the word Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is different from the word God. God is a short form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Those five words are powerful words. What do those mean? Is one thing we have to be very clear about. Because God is not Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Supreme Personality of Godhead is a, trans is a translation of the word Bhagavan. 
And we often use the words Bhagavan and God interchangeably, but so do we with the word Ishwara and God and, you know, um, Brahman and God and Paramatma and God. Now, in the Sanskrit language, Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan, Ishwar are very distinct words, and we have to respect that. When we use the word God to describe all of that, we are trying to explain, uh, we are trying to relish the flavor of garam masala through the taste of salt and pepper, and it's not possible. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the first thing. So in that sense, I, you know, I once went to give a talk and I said, one of the things that I, my, one of my core academic arguments is God is not Vishnu. Because the word God has a very specific Judeo-Christian Abrahamic connotation. And in the English language, we may use it. But we have to look at the specific tikas of the Bhagavatam and the verses and the, you know, the, the primary text to understand what exactly is the context of that word. In English, it just says God or Supreme Personality of God at one. And the second point I wanted to mention is that the teachings of Krishna for Bhaktivinoda Thakur and for all of our acharyas, as far as I understand it, is for the well-being of the planet and it gives an alternative vision of the universe. That means when somebody st stands under a dark night sky and looks up at the stars, they see a vast universe where there are all these heavenly bodies that are going around, you know, in their respective orbits, but all of them are dead. That's what, you know, mechanistic, empirical science tells us. We do not find life in our shape and form in anything that we see. Mm. The Bhagavatam gives an alternative perspective. That is, this universe is not bleak. This universe, in fact, is full of joy and bliss if you give up the illusion that you are the Lord and Master of it all and you become a servant. And you learn to look at the universe through the lens of rasa. And when you do that, all these universes, this is the first, this is the cover of Srila Prabhupada's Srimad, the first edition of Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, that within every universe, there is transcendental rasa. And that's how we look at these universes. And this was the idea behind what we now call the Temple of Vedic Planetarium, but this is also Bhakti Thakur's idea, that we must demonstrate the universe that we look at is very different from how Western colonial traditions are asking us to imagine it to be. It is a rasika universe. Right? You can talk to plants and the moon is a beautiful place. Without this approach, life becomes intolerable. It becomes purposeless. Why are we even here? Why are we going through our daily grind? Right? But the moment we understand this, a lot of our internal suffering gets resolved and so does a lot of our external suffering. Hmm. And people who are trying to reduce human suffering by creating airplanes and telegraph machines and so on and so forth, are doing a great job. And I have a, cha I have a chapter that I'm working on right now for my book from SUNY, um, where I talk about this. That these inventions, modern scientific inven inventions are great, they are awesome. But the metaphysics that underlies these inventions will eventually lead to the commodification of life. And there is also an article by Bhaktivinoda Thakur on this, that if we boil down the human body to this carbon and calcium and this and that, what is your value? Not more than 11 rupees, maybe. He writes an article, these exact words, right? But the moment you realize the point of subjectivity, mm. that means you, are ha you have a unique perspective on things, and you are somebody who is capable of experiencing refined emotions and being happy even within this lifetime, right? And then you suddenly realize the whole universe, the skies are floating around, and this is a verse from the Krishna Samhita from Bhakti Thakur. just like Krishna is the Dhruva star and all the other stars, like all the other constellations circle it, right? We jivas circle the source of these transcendental emotions, even if we don't understand what it is. Let's call it Krishna. 
Akhilara Sharmita Murti Pasrimara Taraka Pali, Prabhu Goswami says. Krishna is Akhilo, all Rasa Amrita Murti. He is the embodiment of the immortal, transcendental emotions that can be found anywhere in the universe. Yeah. That's the definition of Krishna. And after that, the rest are details and they come as a person progresses in Bhakti. Mm. So Sorry, I'll shut up. I've been speaking too much. I want to hear your, your thoughts on what I said so far. Yeah. So it seems somehow in the broadening of the presentation of Bhakti, mm. the idea of Krishna and Rasa in relationship with Krishna may sometimes get lost either in the basically I think there are three different things now. There are there are practices and there are beliefs. And beyond that, there are experiences. And also are, realizations. Realizations or experiences, whatever you all want to use for it. Anubhav as you as uh, Swami's talk about it. So hmm. sometimes we get so caught either in imposing the rules or arguing about the rationality of the beliefs mm. that we may miss out on either we ourselves having the experience or yeah. others have that experience. Exactly. Exactly. And Each individual is on their own journey. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that even if they worship devatas, they are ultimately, you know, they are coming towards me. Um, and, you know, we Bhagavatam says how we do upeksha of people who are envious, but those who are open minded, we help them, those who are equals to us, we associate with them, mm. and those who are senior to us, we learn from them. Yes, right. And it is, it is destructive to actually, you know, shake up whatever firm belief an individual has. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur, like Martin Luther, makes a makes a distinction between faith and belief. Okay. Belief is holding on to ideas that we think are true. And even if we see counter arguments or counter evidence, it shakes our faith. And so belief is something that Kanishthas or Komala Shraddhas really need to bank on. Mm. Whereas faith is something that is, you know, spontaneously ingrained in every living being, whether they accept it or not. Falling in love is an act of faith. You know, getting married is an act of faith. Getting on a bus on an airplane is an act of faith because faith is the assumption. Faith is the assumption that the circumstances that I have, that I experience, will continue to work in my favor, and even if it is unfavorable, I can fight and I can transcend it or I can overcome it, right? So faith is the trust that this process and I go along very well together and this works, Shraddha. So faith, so Biswash, so faith Biswash is more, and Shraddha are different things. Sorry? So faith is more like a, you could say, operational assumption Whereas belief is more like a, like a, you could say an conviction, idea. conviction about certain ideas. Yeah, inarguable tenet. It's more yeah. about abstract truths, whereas faith is more dynamic, more operational. That yes, that's a, that's that's absolutely right. So what are the, so, are the Sanskrit words to differentiate belief and faith? Bi, Bangla words: bishash. Bishash is belief. Okay. You know, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Well, somebody tomorrow can come and, you know, kind of cut that apart and say no. And then my belief will be hurt and I will lose my belief. But faith is, I am very minute. I need to surrender to somebody, something bigger than me. I am looking for bliss in the world and I know it is attainable. That is faith. And so he points this out in his book, Tattva Viveka, not Bhakti Tattva Viveka. Okay. And he says there are 12 foundational principles, universal foundational principles of spiritual life. Just one minute. Before yeah. you go there. So can I, I'm just trying to clarify the difference because you, yes. let's say, if we talk about belief, it's more about the nature of reality. Faith is 
more about the nature of what really works for me also the nature of reality faith is that dimension of us that tells us obosho rokhibe krishna bishwaso palon that no matter what happens i'm all right and things will be all right no but right? and belief is a certain conviction about certain ideas that we think is true right and it is it is it is our banking on these ideas belief is uh, basically you know i believe in santa claus right and many i think many kids are convinced that santa claus exists but then somebody tells them no actually your parents were giving you and then suddenly they are shattered but that's also a part of growing up and so people who come to the path of bhakti also have certain beliefs that get shattered before they assume this path mm-hmm. right but faith is that principle that makes them go from their previous state to this new state and say that i am a seeker of truth and i will find it or i have a larger shelter of joy which is beyond me and if i do x y and z i will actually get there that is faith so that's why i said falling in love is an act of faith so or getting on an airplane is an act of faith so that if i for faith more connected with the process and belief is more connected with some tenets conviction that ideas in our head okay next one and bhakti vinod thakur points out that beliefs may change and mature as you go along but faith gets deeper right okay and with more time with more realizations the more we are open minded and the more we explore in this path of bhakti Mm. the more we will see the the what is the nature of faith and why it is important right and our beliefs might change and i mean think about it you know i have been practicing what 32 34 years now mm. and what i believed when i was 20 on the path of krishna consciousness is very different from what i believe today That's and it happens to most people you ask any any version of anywhere that 10 years back or 5 years back whatever beliefs you had did you change your beliefs and everybody will say yeah i used to think this but now after reading shastra i think this or this realization came i'm not sure what do you think right so beliefs are constantly changing faith on the other hand remains do you see what i'm saying yeah no so going back earlier you talk about the difference between the term god and the terms say ishwara or brahman or parmatma or bhagwan so again was that also to stress the point of the difference of rasa that god has a particular uh, connotation and yes yes um but more than just rasa um it it also has to do with language and culture bhakti mano thakur says that to understand rasa we need many many elements such as gop uh, gopi vrindavan uh, you know um uh, alamban uddipan and so on and so forth right so a tamal tree in vrindavan reminds you of krishna because krishna is tamal krishna he is dark like a tamal tree now you try to look for tamal trees in michigan good luck it won't work <laughs> so what would be the alamban in michigan you know and our common friend hari parshak prabhu came and said the thai bhav of michigan is depression <laughs> it's like a permanent permanent mood <laughs> right and i agree with him now bhakti vinod thakur said that future sharagrahis will understand krishna bhakti so well that they will be able to translate rasa rasa, rasa uh, lila gopa gopi brindavan alamban udipan in their own language in their own culture and this is the gift of shriman mahabhuri right that is uh, to be able to translate rasa and experience the states of bhava and eventually rasa rasa nishpatti uh, is what 
Mahaprabhu tried to give to the whole world, and he says that they have Vaishnavism. Right? We don't have to preach to anybody. We don't have to convert anybody. We don't have to make somebody change their names to a Hindu name and wear dhoti kurta to become Vaishnav. But let them understand what we have to offer and let them culturally translate that into their own, own you know, situation without deviations. Right? And that is why, for example, if somebody puts a Santa Claus hat on a Krishna vigraha, on a deity, it's a rasa bhasha. It's, you know, it's like imposing, <laughs> you know, the, the, Jesus Christ never saw a snowflake, so to say. And I'm not using the word snowflake in a political connotation, mm-hmm. but he never literally, he, he was in Palestine. Jesus Christ never saw a Christmas tree. He wasn't even born on December 25th. It mm-hmm. was the Roman emperor, Constantine. You know this history and I know this. Yeah. And then the Christmas traditions that we have, you know, whether... It's uh, music in supermarkets or Christmas trees with, you know, those hockey stick candies, whatever. Now, taking those things and imposing it on Krishna may be sweet for some people, but it also demonstrates a total non-understanding. I wouldn't even say misunderstanding, a non-understanding of rasa. Right? So now, but, if you're saying that people have to culturally translate, then wouldn't that be considered an acceptable translation? Santa Claus is it, it is it is it is that we, well I would say it is not if even if it is it's not a mature cultural translation maybe a kindergarten level cultural translation the the real cultural translation comes I would argue in the books of Bhaktivinoda Thakur where he shows how to culturally translate certain certain things like this idea of an Eastern savior the idea of a savior itself. Yeah, what exactly are you saving somebody from? Right? Mm-hmm. In Christianity, it is, the, it is saving from eternal damnation the original and sin. also the original sin that you inherited. Yeah. And so what Christianity, generally speaking, posits are the, are, is, the, is the cause and the consequence of our suffering. Mm. Vaishnavism or practically all traditions of Hinduism focus on suffering too. If you, if you look at Sankhya philosophy, that is non-theistic in its original form, is a dukkha traya avikhata. The three miseries, that's what we want to resolve. Yeah. Vedanta, any philosophy you go to, Buddhism, they all want to reduce suffering. Mm. So in terms of our attempt, the human attempt to reduce suffering, everybody's engaged in the same project. It's just that our metaphysics are different and our methods are different. Right? And that is what Bhaktivinoda Thakur is trying to point out. And all our acharyas are trying to point out that you're all trying to solve the same problem. The question is, do we come to a neutral stage where our problem is solved but nothing positive is happening? And that is Advaita. And it's transcendental too. Hmm. Or are you going to bracket the oneness part of everything and engage in service and loving exchange? And if you're one, you can't have love because as they say in English, it takes two to tango. Hmm. <laughs> so it, I would say it takes two to bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so right now in that example, I just culturally translated the difference between Advaita Vedanta and Bhakti Vedanta philosophy. So translating doesn't necessarily mean putting a Santa Claus costume on Krishna. If somebody loves to do that, more power to them, if that makes them more Krishna conscious, who am I to intervene or comment or say anything? Hmm. It's between them and whatever they are doing. But when it comes to Siddhanta and Rasa, this cultural translation is a lifetime project for multiple generations. It mm. won't happen in just your generation or you know, even our children's generation. If you think about it, Bhaktivana Thakur wrote in 1896 that you know, when will that day come when people recognize the name of Sriman Mahaprabhu? Mm. He didn't see it. And it's not till, you know, even now we are wondering what happened Yes, there were waves of Sankirtan on the way. 
But Sankirtan movement was very big in Bengal, but very small compared to the rest of the world. Yeah. And the ambition, and this is one, again, one thing Wendy Doniger and I went back and forth on multiple times. Her point was, why is this not a megalomaniac agenda? Right? Because, you know, Napoleon wanted to conquer the whole world. Right? And there are statements like that, that, you know, Prabhupada says, we want to culturally conquer the whole world. Why is that not a megalomaniac agenda? And my answer to that is, it would be megalomaniac if it boosted the ego of one person who want to rule over everything. But the moment this person learns how to become a servant and puts the interest of Mother Bhumi and Father Dharma, so to say, according to the Bhagavad, mm. as the topmost priority, then it is not megalomaniac. If you say that climate change is going to be a disaster for future generations, we must stop this you know, frequent amount of air travel. And therefore, we need to have this, 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 and this measures. The Paris Climate Accord, for example, the people who run it or the people who conceived it and helped implement it are not megalomaniacs. They are not trying to control the world. And if they are, they are trying to control the world for the planet's benefit. So whose interests are you putting forward? And if you look at the Mahabharata, Krishna says very clearly that my first commitment is to Mother Bhumi. Because there is the section where the sage asks, Krishna, you could have stopped the war. Why did you let it happen? Mm. And Krishna says, I tried, but my first commitment is to Mother Bhumi. And how is Mother Bhumi going to you know, flourish? Bhagavatam first kind of says, Father Dharma, the bull, mm. because of these times, has lost his three legs and is tottering on the fourth. Right? As long as we preserve Dharma, Bhumi will be a wonderful place to live in. And what is Dharma? It's basic ethics, basic ethics. You don't need to be a yogi. You don't need to be a bhakta. You don't need to be a Vaishnava. And that's why Bhakti Thakur used to often say, first become a human being, then you can think about becoming a Vaishnava. Aage manusha, tapur Oh, really? That's a direct quote from him, huh? Many, even Prabhupada said, you know, first come to the human platform. Four regulative principles is coming to the human platform. Hmm. Any decent human being will be, will have integrity, honesty. Right, they'll be clean hygienically, also in terms of their dealings. Right, they must, you know, work every day for their own sustenance. But most importantly, they must be compassionate and kind. These four are basically the four legs of dharma. So it's you know rather than looking at them as the four things not to do, which can come off as imposing or uh, sectarian to some extent, you can look at them more as for virtues and nobody was actually going to argue that these are not virtues. These exactly. are virtues. And even from a, even if it doesn't think from a religious perspective, even from a normal human perspective, these are desirable virtues. Like, yeah, yeah. The way in which the virtues are to be translated into real life, the standards that are to be there, they are secondary. They are important, yes. but they're secondary. But the so if you focus on the principle of these virtues, then that's also a ground for universal, as you said, bringing together. That is very true. So it seems In fact, that, if, uh, that it seems that you know, there is, it's just a matter of perspective. The same principles could be either presented in a way that is off-putting and seems sectarian, or the same principles could be put in a way which is attractive and unifying. So it's, it's very true, very true. In fact, in Sanskrit, we have this thing called Vidhi and Nishetha. Yes. Right? Yeah. Vidhi means the principle, what you should do, and Nishetha is what is the bare minimum you shouldn't do. So when we go to a doctor, he says, you take this medicine, but don't eat cold things because you have a sore throat. Mm. That's the basic minimum you shouldn't do. So when Prabhupada is using the terms for regulative principles, he is presenting the Nishethas, that this is the bare minimum you shouldn't do. Hmm. Right? But the principle is much more powerful, much broader, and it's there in the Bhagavatam. The, the foundations of Krishna consciousness, that we, the way we understand, is four regulatory principles, chant 16 rounds, 
and take initiation and the rest is the rest are details. Uh, our acharyas give a very different trajectory. That is 16 rounds minimum. That if you don't think about Krishna the rest of the day, you're not Krishna conscious, whatever, at least take out an hour and a half every day for mm -hmm. this. It's important. The principle is not Kirtanya 16 rounds. The principle is Kirtanya Shadavu. Mm -hmm. yeah? 16 rounds minimum. If you're not doing anything, if you're not engaging in Krishna Katha, you're not studying Bhagavatam, you have a whole day where you know, you're engaging in things that you have absolutely no control over, at least take some time out early in the morning, chant 16 rounds. That's the bare minimum. But if you can, if you organize your life in such a way that you can 24 hours speak about Krishna, you know, engage in devotional service in some form or the other, then, you know, just as Krishna says, the purpose of a small body of water is fulfilled by a great ocean. Similarly, the purpose of 16 rounds is fulfilled by Kirtan Yashadahuri. And regulatory principles is basically trying to get somebody on a very, very basic platform of ethics, right? And I think to conclude that flow of thoughts, there is a severe lack, a severe misunderstanding of both Sanskrit and English when people read Prabhupada's books. Because Prabhupada's English is from, remember, the early 1900s and English has changed a lot. All languages change, right? If we read Shakespeare, we won't understand Shakespeare. And now if you go back and read Beowulf, which was a thousand years back, that English wouldn't even stand out as English. So Prabhupada gave the Sanskrit verses because that part is as it is. I mean, it's non-compromising, right? Mm. And he encouraged us to go back and read the works of our previous teachers. And Acharya literally means in the Western world, a professor. That previous <laughs> luminaries or previous professors, right? And just as to study history of religions, I not only have to go to Wendy Doniger, but I also have to read Edward Dimock and Marcia Aliade because they are the previous Acharyas in that particular field. In the field of Krishna Bhakti, there are previous Acharyas going back all the way to Lord Krishna himself. Hmm. Right? And this is the reason Prabhupada was very insistent that this can come from Hindu culture, but Krishna consciousness is non-sectarian. It doesn't belong to one particular religion, just like yoga is non-sectarian. It doesn't, right? And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says very clearly, Hinduism is my, Hindu is my culture, Vaishnavism is my religion. And so Vaishnavism flurry, flourishes within Hindu culture, just as Boeing and Airbus flourishes within Western capitalist culture. Mm. Right? Now, airplanes are Western, but they do not belong to the West. They belong to the whole world. Similarly, for our inner development, Krishna Bhakti is universal because it belongs to the whole world, even though it emerges out of Hindu culture. That's all I have to say for now. That's beautiful. A very good example of how when we have to do cult, this brings us back to the earlier point of cultural translation that yes. if you want to do cultural translation, we have to, we can just arbitrarily impose cultural symbols, but we have to do it in a way that actually serves the purpose. So Hinduism yes. is the culture, Vaishnavism is the religion. The religion is the sense what gives us transcendental experience. And yeah, what gives us meaning in life. Yes, and how that will be translated, is that can be like a life that can require lifetimes of effort. Uh, yeah. And Absolutely. That's true. So, it's been Sorry for taking your podcast in 20 different directions. <laughs> it's been wonderful talking uh, to you, Prabhu. Thank you for your time. Thank and you for thank you for your time and having me here. And uh, it is good to hear your voice and see your face after a long time. Yes, yeah, true. See you again sometime soon. Hare Krishna. See you. Please take care. Radhisham. Hare Krishna.